We're honoured to be welcoming Dr. Hajun Chang here today, who's a well-respected economist and professor at Cambridge University. Uh, he's written many acclaimed books, such as Bad Samaritans, 23 Things They Don't Tell You About Capitalism, and Kicking Away the Ladder. This is just naming a few. Um, Kicking Away the Ladder won the Gunnar Myrdal Prize in 2003. 2005, Dr. Hajun Chang won the Leon TF Prize for Advancing the Frontiers of Economic Thought. And in 2014, he was ranked in the top 20 world thinkers by Prospect Magazine. Uh, and he's here today to talk on the myth of post-industrial knowledge economy, which will pro approximately last an hour, followed by around 30-minute Q&A. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Hajun Chang. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, it's been a long time since uh, I was in New York, so I'm very, very pleased to be back here. And yes, I mean, the, the exams are approaching and you know, there's a tough time for you guys. And I really appreciate the fact that uh, you uh, came to listen to me. So I should uh, try to make it a bit more interesting than the usual talks that you get in the economics uh, societies. <laughs> right, so let me begin by saying that there are lots of things that you think are facts, but are no such things. So some of you probably know this, uh, French fries were not invented in France. It was uh, invented in Belgium, and at that the Dutch-speaking part of Belgium, not the French-speaking part. Eh? So this confusion is really I mean, hard to understand because, you know, if it was the French speakers in Belgium, you know, Belgium is a small country, you know, you think they're all French, you know. A lot of people thought that Hercule Poirot was of uh, the French, you know. So you could understand, but uh, when you actually go to Belgium, they call it the Flemish fries, yeah? So how did that come about, yeah? Another thing that you probably didn't know about is that Panama hats are actually not from Panama. <laughs> they are from Ecuador. If you meet an Ecuadorian, uh, mention this fact, then he or she will become friend, uh, the, your friend for life. Yeah? <laughs> because uh, the Ecuadorian national pride is very, very hurt by this. Yeah? The hat is uh, made in Ecuador, especially in this uh, town called Cuenca. Uh, now, it acquired the name Panama Hat uh, during the construction of the Panama Canal, during which the construction company bought these uh, the hats in bulk and distributed them to, to their workers so that uh, they could be protected from sunlight. Yeah? Now, the uh, name unfortunately got stuck. And when I was uh, in Ecuador, probably this was about a decade ago, I had a chance to meet the head of the state export promotion agency, and he said, we are so hurt by this, we tried to sell them as Ecuadorian hats, and then people were willing to pay 10% of the price. <laughs> so we had to swallow our pride and call it Panama hat, we sometimes, you know, the push the boundary by calling it Ecuadorian Panama hat, but <laughs> you know, it's a losing battle. Yeah? Now, in terms of this, uh, the supposed facts are parading as uh, uh, so, uh, uh, the, these are uh, the uh, falsehoods that are parading as facts. No one can beat uh, Switzerland, and the best way to talk about it is uh, through this uh, movie called The Third Man. This is a really old movie, 1949, so even before I was born. And it's a movie about uh, black marketeering in penicillin right after the war, Second World War in Vienna. So at the time, penicillin was a, a very, very valuable commodity which only the Americans and the British uh, could uh, produce. So this uh, became like gold. Yeah? And that uh, there's, I mean, like in many other things, uh, the black market and the stories about this man who kind of uh, goes to Vienna hearing that his close friend died in an accident 
and then later realizes that, that his friend was actually uh, a kind of underworld boss that, that, that kind of organizing this uh, the black market in penicillin and he faked his death uh, that, to avoid uh, police capture. And that evil character is uh, played by this uh, famous American uh, actor called uh, uh, Orson Welles. Uh, you probably have seen his other movie, Citizen Kane. Yeah? Anyway, that uh, Welles uh, appears as this guy, uh, Harry Lyme, the yeah, uh, kind of uh, the drug lord. And there's one scene in which uh, Harry Lyme, when he's uh, confronted uh, by his uh, friend, uh, tries to argue his way out by arguing that actually being evil is good. You know, when did being good do anything good? Yeah. So the way he argues about it is the following. He said, in Italy, for 30 years under the Borgias, they had all the bad things about human nature. Warfare, murder, bloodshed, but they gave us the Renaissance. In Switzerland, they had brotherly love. They had 500 years of democracy and peace. And what did they produce? The cuckoo clock. Huh? Right, the case uh, rest. Now, the amazing thing is that uh, in the last two sentences that contain 23 words, there are five falsehood hidden. So this must be some kind of world record for kind of uh, falsehood per word. So how do you spot this? It's a bit of a reversal of uh, that uh, BBC Radio 4 show that called Unbelievable Truth. Have you? Right, right. That, that, if you haven't, that, 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 go and listen to them. They are fascinating. Okay, so people are given this uh, little lecture, which is completely false, except for five hidden truths. Yeah? So now I'm uh, going to give you yeah, five uh, hidden facts uh, that will uh, surprise you. So first of all, 500 years of democracy. Well, excuse me, I am not sure what we are talking about because, you know, I, I don't know about other people, but I don't call a country where half the population cannot vote a democracy. Eh? Switzerland gave women votes only in 1971. Eh? So Swiss democracy is not 500 years old. It's not even 45 years old. Eh? <laughs> Actually, if you count these uh, two row cantons which uh, refused to give uh, women votes in local elections, although they had to give uh, the women votes in the, the federal elections by federal law, we are talking about 1991. Yeah? This is uh, after the, the fall of the Soviet Union. You know? the South Korea was a military dictatorship, became a democracy in 1987. Yeah? <laughs> and uh, the, the, we think uh, that this democracy is uh, 500 years old. Yeah? 500 years of uh, peace, well, not quite. They had a few wars with their neighbors. And then 500 years of uh, brotherly love, uh, that, that rubbish. <laughs> they had no less than four civil wars in 200 years in the 17th and 18th, uh, the, in 17th and uh, 19th century. The cuckoo clock was not invented in Switzerland. <laughs> it was invented in Germany. So actually, this is another mystery because uh, you know, in the case of French fries, you can understand that the kind of bigger countries stole the glory. But you know, shame on you Germans! I mean, that uh, how can you lose this uh, to a tiny neighbor? Eh? <laughs> you are ten times bigger than Switzerland, and people think this was invented in Switzerland. Eh? And finally. Talking about the cuckoo clock, uh, Switzerland is not an economy living off the black money deposited by third world dictators and selling tacky souvenirs like cuckoo clocks to American and Japanese tourists, or if you want to be nice to it, a post-industrial <coughs> economy relying on services like banking and tourism, which is what you think uh, Switzerland is. Yeah? It is actually the most industrialized country in the world. It has the highest per capita manufacturing value added. 
86% more than the US, you know, nine times more than the supposed uh, workshop of the world, China. It is uh, literally the most industrialized country in the world. Of course, uh, you don't see many made in Swiss, Switzerland products. Well, first, uh, because it's uh, that small, about 9 million people. Yeah, so per capita terms, it may be producing a lot, but in, in the, the, the terms of uh, total quantity, it's not a lot. But secondly, and probably more importantly, it specializes in what the economists call producer goods. Yeah? So machines, yeah? industrial chemicals. Yeah, so in terms of uh, the, the consumer products, uh, there aren't that many things that are made in Switzerland. Yeah? I mean, the Nestle produces some of its output in its uh, the, uh, home country, Switzerland, but it's only about 5% of worldwide output of uh, Nestle, so you get some food items uh, here and there. And then, of course, uh, there are a couple of important pharmaceutical companies, but that's about it, yeah? well, other than those expensive watches that you know, people like you and me can never buy. So well, what am I assuming? Maybe some of you are you know, very rich and uh, you have one, but uh, you know. So the, we, we don't see many made in Switzerland products and we think that uh, it's kind of service-based economy because there are a couple of very important uh, the, the international banks, uh, quite a lot of uh, the, uh, private banks uh, that are uh, catering for the world's uh, super rich and then you know, tourism is famous, so you think it's a post-industrial economy, but actually it is the most industrialized economy in the world. Yeah? More than Japan, more than Germany, more than China. Huh? Well, why am I spending so much time talking about Switzerland? Because it directly challenges one of the greatest myths of our time, that is the myth that we now live in a post-industrial knowledge economy, in which making things that is manufacturing is not important anymore. You've all heard of this uh, discourse, you know. According to this story, our economy has been fundamentally transformed during the last few decades, especially in the rich countries. The manufacturing industry, once the driving force of capitalism, has uh, become very unimportant. Now in many rich countries, 80%, uh, 90% uh, uh, of uh, output is in services. Hmm? Manufacturing account for 10, maybe 20, maybe 25% and uh, declining. And people say there's a natural tendency for the relative demand for services to rise with uh, prosperity and therefore this uh, decline will continue. And also recently, according to this uh, discourse, a lot of high productivity, knowledge basis services have emerged. Yeah? So finance, business consulting, engineering, design, architecture, and so on. So service industries, not the old kind of you know, low productivity, sort of servant type uh, uh, activities anymore. And with this uh, process uh, known as deindustrialization, it is argued that the rich countries definitely have entered the post industrial age where most people work in services and most outputs are services. Some people go even further and argue that the decline of manufacturing is not just something that we don't need to worry about because it's a natural phenomenon, but it is something to celebrate. Yeah? Now it's uh, that uh, we are living in this uh, knowledge economy. Yeah? Manufacturing is not important anymore. It's that uh, become low-grade uh, activity that uh, poor countries like China or Vietnam do. And it may be, therefore, even better for some developing countries to skip industrialization altogether and develop their economy on the basis of services. Yeah? Many people often cite uh, India as an example of this. Yeah. A lot of services have 
re relocated to India, so back offices of airlines and banks and credit card companies, software engineers, yeah? call centers. Yeah? I mean, where, I don't know, guys in the, the, the Mumbai that uh, pretend to speak in Texan accent. Yeah? Uh, and when they pick up the phone, they say, oh, that, that, uh, good afternoon, uh, it's uh, that, that sunny in the Austin, Texas. <laughs> and is actually sitting in Bangalore or yeah, Mumbai. This argument is very popular, it's uh, very widely accepted. It's not completely false, like the cuckoo clock story, but it is very, very shaky and I mean, that has uh, misled so many people that I think we need to expose this. Eh? Well, first of all, this argument is about the industrialization is correct in terms of employment. Eh? Oh, sorry, I should have, you know. Well. You know, now much lower proportion of people in the rich countries work in manufacturing compared to the early days of their economic development. So. In the late 19th, early 20th century, in some countries like the UK and Belgium, yeah, Belgium is another country that, that uh, is uh, highly industrialized. You know, you think that uh, all they produce is uh, waffles and tintin, but uh, <laughs> it was actually one of the most industrialized uh, economies uh, together with the UK in the 19th and the early 20th century. Anyway, in those countries, uh, I'm sorry that the PowerPoint is a bit screwed up, but in those countries, uh, around 40% of population at one point work in the manufacturing sector. Right? This is a huge number. Right? Today, the share of people who work in manufacturing is around 15% in most developed countries. In some countries, it could be over 20%, like Germany, Taiwan, and Slovenia. But in some of them, like the UK, the US, the Netherlands, Canada, it could be as low as 9 to 10%. Yeah? And with so much fewer people working in factories, the nature of society has changed. You know, I'm not kind of an industrial sociologist or anything like that, so what I'm going to say here is uh, pretty basic, but you know, we are partly formed by our work experience. So if you do different work, you become different people. Hmm? So for example, in the, the factory, you never meet your customers. Yeah? You make things and then the company sells it. Yeah? If you are working in the, the service sector, there's a good chance that you actually have an interaction as your customer, whether you're a bank teller or management consultant or an accountant. In the manufacturing, people have to use a lot of uh, their physical energy to do their work, and their work is uh, very strictly controlled by the setup, you know, the machines, the conveyor belt. You know? So that they have very little control over what they do the manufacturing workers, whereas in the service sector, there's a lot more control over your work process. Although, I mean, some people are really trying hard to change this. You know? Amazon has these uh, mega warehouses uh, where workers are fitted with the uh, GPS uh, locators. And if they stay in one place for more than two minutes, they you know, call them. You know? What are they that, that doing? You know? Move on. You know? Don't dawdle. You know? so, you know, the, these guys have uh, actually not much uh, control over how they work, but generally speaking, service sector workers have a lot more control over their work than the, the manufacturing workers. Hmm? Factory workers uh, cooperate m a lot more with each other in their work process because that, uh, you know, it's a continuous process, related process, rather than you know, one guy going to a customer, talking to him, and no, another guy uh, flying to the, the Stuttgart uh, to you know, give a presentation on his uh, consulting work. You know? And partly because of this, uh, the manufacturing sector workers are much more unionized and they have uh, the more political impacts. Eh? I mean, I could go on, but you know, 
who needs an amateur <coughs> sociologist uh, to lecture about this. Yeah? But the point is that when you have people, uh, sorry, a lot more people working in services rather than in manufacturing, then the nature of society changes. You know? So in that sense, we are living in a post-industrial economy. Huh? When 10% instead of about 43% of the population works in the manufacturing sector, the society becomes different. Yeah? However, in other respects, uh, sorry, uh, I shouldn't go there yet. However, in other respects, <coughs> even the richest economies have not really become post-industrial. These other res respects that uh, I'm talking about are production and consumption. So we are actually producing and consuming a lot more manufacturing output than we think we are. We are actually producing and consuming not always, but usually more manufacturing output at uh, manufacturing products than the numbers that, that, that seem to tell you. Yeah? Let me explain. Now, when you look at the statistics, you will see that you know, at one point, manufacturing used to account for, say, 45% of uh, British GDP. Now it's uh, barely 10 you know, the, the manufacturing used to account for 40% uh, of uh, British employment, now it's barely 10, and you s say there's a huge reduction, but actually the reduction hasn't been as much as uh, you think. Because uh, first of all, this, uh, has, is, uh, the, uh, there are some optical illusions, yeah? So for example, in the recent uh, the, decades, that, uh, say especially since the 1980s, especially in the US and the UK, a lot of uh, non-core activities in manufacturing companies have been outsourced. Yeah? And this creates the illusion that there are more service activities than before. Yeah? Because that, uh, say, I mean, I'm exaggerating, but in 1950, you had a Ford factory which did everything from catering and cleaning services to manufacturing to design and engineering and you know, even some aspects of uh, management consult consultancy. Yeah? They have outsourced a lot of these activities, spun uh, some of the, the, the divisions uh, into a separate company, and then you think now there are all these new activities called you know, that uh, catering services and consultancy services and design services. No, actually, this activity used to be done in the same company. Now that they are kind of done by separate companies, you think that uh, they are new. They are not new. Yeah? There's another, sorry, that, that this is uh, that at least in the UK and the US considered very significant, although. I cannot find any data. I mean, it's uh, very difficult to uh, estimate this. Yeah? But it is uh, significant uh, uh, by all accounts. Yeah? Also, there's uh, the, what I call reclassification effect. Because that I <laughs> many of the companies do lots of different things. Yeah? So even if you're a manufacturing company, you might actually provide some services. Yeah? You are building, I don't know, uh, dialysis machine, and then yeah, you have these uh, people who do after-sale service, and you might uh, even provide some you know, consultancy service to hospitals and so on. Yeah? And you know, companies, however, have to be classified as one or the other. Yeah? So when companies uh, see that uh, what they do. I mean, the composition of what they do changes, uh, they can apply to be classified in a different way. And one uh, British government report uh, published in 2006 uh, on this issue of uh, deindustrialization estimated that 10% of UK deindustrialization in terms of employment between 1998 and 2006 
was basically due to this uh, reclassification effect. Yeah? So manuf what used to be at, at the called a manufacturing company applies to be reclassified as a, a service company. However, the, in doing that, they are not actually shutting down their manufacturing lines. Yeah? It's uh, still there. Yeah? But then that, uh, that's now counted as a uh, service uh, that, uh, activity. Yeah? So it's uh, the opposite of, uh, in a way, the, the outsourcing effect. Yeah? So this, uh, the, according to this report, is, uh, was actually quite significant. Yeah? Another cause of uh, deindustrialization, which is genuine rather than optical illusion, is international trade. But uh, if you look at various empirical studies, this is estimated to have caused probably between 15 and at most 30% uh, of the industrialization. So, I mean, this is effect of, you know, now China's making everything, yeah? So no one else makes anything, yeah? Well, I mean, <laughs> that's of course uh, the, uh, the illusion, but uh, so the, the usual estimate is that, uh, yeah, probably, uh, one fifth, uh, the one quarter of uh, the industrialization in the last uh, two, three decades has been due to relocation of manufacturing to countries like China and then the, the, the things being exported uh, to the rich countries. Eh? And then there's the view that the bulk of the industrialization can be explained by the natural tendency of the relative demand for manufactured goods to fall with rising prosperity. Yeah? So when you're poor, you first need to eat, yeah? and then you begin to buy manufactured things. Yeah? The first of all, basic things like clothing and soap, and, and then when you become richer, you uh, uh, begin to buy more sophisticated uh, things like TV and uh, mobile telephone, and then when you're really rich, then you go on a safari tour in Kenya. Yeah? You the, the hire a, the, the guy to do your tax accounting. So that's the stereotypical story, but actually the, most of the estimates have uh, come up with the conclusion that this is only a very small part of the explanation. Because what is really the most important factor behind this uh, process of uh, deindustrialization is differential productivity growth rates between manufacturing and services. Eh? So uh, let me give you an example. You know, with the same money that uh, you had to pay to get, uh, say, a good computer, say, in the late 1990s, you can buy, I mean, computers of the uh, same power at probably 20% of the price. So computers at the uh, relative prices uh, have fallen uh, uh, Dramatically, because uh, yeah, you might still be buying a thousand pound computer, but a thousand pound what a thousand pound computer today can do is a lot more than what yeah, say a two thousand or even three thousand pound uh, the computer that uh, could do in the old days. Yeah? So suppose that uh, you know, adjusting for quality, your computer is now one quarter of the old price, but then even then uh, you're not going to have uh, four computers. Yeah? So you buy, have two computers. Yeah? On the other hand, haircut, yeah, you have one haircut a month and you still have one haircut a month, yeah? well, unless you have been going bald. Yeah? It happens with a lot of people. Yeah? Well, I mean, not to your age group, but yeah. But the, the price of the, 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 this gives the illusion that you are now spending far more money, far greater the, the proportion of your income on services uh, like haircutting than you are spending on manufactured products like computers. Yeah? Now this happens because the relative prices of manufactured products have uh, fallen quite dramatically, whereas uh, service uh, prices are more or less the same. Yeah? 
So if you recalculate things in the constant prices, you get a very different picture. So for example, the, between the early 1990s and early 2010s, in Germany, Italy, and France, the share of manufacturing output had fallen quite steeply, 20% in Germany, 30% in Italy, and 40% in France. Yeah? If you actually recalculate it in constant prices, using the prices of uh, 1990, the fall has not been so large. I mean, uh, at most 10%, usually less than that. Yeah? In some countries, actually, the share of manufacturing has actually risen. In the U.S. and Switzerland, its share, yeah, in current prices, fell quite a lot, 20-30%, but in constant prices actually rose by about 5%. In Finland and Sweden, actually, even though the yeah, share in current prices fell by 20% plus, if you recalculate them in constant prices, it had uh, grown by 50%. Yeah? So the point is that it looks as if we are spending ever higher shares of our income and services, not because we are consuming ever more services in absolute terms, but mainly because services are becoming ever more expensive in relative terms due to the falling prices of manufactured goods, which are, <coughs> which are due to the, the faster productivity growth in manufacturing. Now, an important exception to this is the UK, in which uh, the share of manufacturing has fallen dramatically in the last quarter of a century, even in constant prices. Yeah? In the case of the UK, it doesn't matter whether you look at it in co current prices or constant prices. Yeah? Because that, uh, the, the, the UK's deindustrialization has been a negative kind, which is largely the result of absolute decline of manufacturing industry due to loss of international competitiveness rather than the relative price effect due to differential product growth rates. So to sum up, uh, up to this point, much of the industrialization actually has happened, not because of the fall in real demand for manufactured products, but because of the fall in the relative prices of manufactured goods, thanks to the higher productivity growth rates in manufacturing industries, than in services. You know, in manufacturing, where mechanization and the use of chemical processes are much easier, it is easier to raise productivity in services. Yeah? So for example, the, 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 some of you might have read the first chapter of uh, the famous book by Adam Smith, The Wealth of Nations, in which uh, he talks about the uh, division of labor discussing how kind of dividing the production process up and making people specialize in that uh, small easy task can raise uh, productivity. He used uh, this uh, example of a pin factory. Yeah? So he said, well, if one person is uh, the, the trying to make a pin, he can make maybe five pins, maximum 20 pins in an hour. Yeah? You have to kind of draw the wire, you have to cut it, you have to sharpen it, you have to uh, attach the, the, the top and whatever. He said, however, if you divide it into like a, a 10 different tasks, you can actually produce thousands of pins yeah? per person, yeah? sorry. So, I mean, that, that's the idea now you know, the, in 1981, uh, Cambridge economist called Cliff Pratton uh, went back to the, this idea and uh, tried to find out how more efficient the pin factories have become and found that uh, they were literally thousands of times uh, more efficient. So the 
I cannot remember the exact number, but actually I did this uh, back of the cal uh, envelope calculation and realized that if something like that happened in agriculture, we would be able to grow wheat in six minutes rather than six hours, uh, six months. Yeah. So that's the kind of uh, productivity differential that we are talking about. And I mean, it does many services are actually even more difficult to uh, increase uh, productivity uh, than agricultural activities. So in some cases, the very increase in productivity will destroy the product itself. Hmm? So if uh, there's a string quoted by, I don't know, Mozart, then you are uh, supposed to play it in 27 minutes. And then some guys come up and say, well, we can play it in nine. We have increased uh, the, our productivity by three times. I mean, that will be a total nonsense. Yeah? Uh, that's an extreme example, but in many <coughs> uh, the service industries, the apparent rise in productivity conceals uh, the debasement of the product. Yeah? So teaching, yes, I mean, up to a point, there's a scale economy, you know, that, that is more or less the same if you are teaching, I don't know, 20 kids rather than the, the 17, yeah? maybe you can push it up to, I don't know, 22, but then if it becomes uh, 42, then the quality of teaching is diluted, yeah? because you cannot give uh, individual attentions anymore. Yeah? yeah, I still remember when I was a uh, kid in South Korea in the, the 1970s, it uh, was a very poor country. I mean, even though I went to, yeah, a private school where the, you had to pay a bit more money. I mean, the, there were 60 kids uh, in one classroom, and you know, in the, the, the state schools, uh, there were 100 kids, 110 kids in a single classroom, and teachers were doing double shift, uh, triple shift uh, to save the building cost. Yeah? So how do you teach in that kind of room? Well, I mean, you have to beat the kids all the time and uh, the make them learn everything I wrote. Yeah, yeah so it can be done, you know. <laughs> But, you know, you have uh, debased the quality of the product that you are producing. Yeah? Same with uh, retail services. Yeah? yeah, so now, say, that when I first arrived in this country as a graduate student, if you want to buy a pair of shoes, yeah, you go to a shoe shop. Yeah? And then you go there, and within a couple of minutes, someone comes and asks you, what do you want? You explain uh, that, uh, that he or she gives you some pairs, you try them, and yeah, I mean, you buy a pair and you leave. Hmm? These days, you have to, well, when you walk into a shoe shop, first you have to take the ticket hmm? and wait for 20 minutes before anyone even pays attention to you. Hmm? And finally, someone comes and uh, says, okay, da, da, what do you want? Okay, I'll da, 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 get them and disappears for 15 minutes. Hmm? because that, that she's uh, serving uh, four customers at the same time. Yeah, yeah so the output of uh, shoe sales has uh, eno enormously increased because uh, now one person is uh, doing the work of uh, the, the four. Yeah? But the quality of retail service itself has been completely debased. Yeah? They're actually exploiting customers' uh, free time. Yeah? No, because uh, instead of uh, 10 minutes, now I'm but, uh, spending 45 minutes to buy a pair of shoes. Yeah? And in the meantime, getting bored and, you know, desperately that, uh, looking for this uh, the shop assistant who disappeared behind some door, saying that, 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 that she'll get uh, my pair of shoes and then yeah, hasn't turned up for 25 minutes. Yeah? Same story with uh, things like finance, you know, we, until the financial crisis in 2008, we thought actually alchemy was possible in the finance, yeah? because that, that you had these people who said that we can turn these uh, subprime mortgages. I mean, Americans are that, that, that very good at uh, inventing these that, that terms which are kind of sound nice, but which actually the abuses, you know. Subprime means uh, basically very risky, dangerous yeah? loans. I mean, these are basically people who have uh, very precarious jobs and irregular income, you know, the, the checkered financial history. And then, you know, I, I don't have time to go into that, but uh, so some people that, that you know, came up with this idea that you can 
you know, the pull them and the structure them and slash them and sell them uh, separately as uh, the, the CDOs and uh, you know, uh, all these uh, exotic products. And then yeah, the later we realize that this is all a con. Yeah? So the taxpayers had to stump up a huge amount of money to save these uh, financial institutions and then they were told that we have no money so we are going to cut your welfare. Yeah? So actually it cost a lot to the economy but then for a while, I mean, if you looked at the productivity of the financial industry in the UK and the US, uh, you thought this was uh, that, that, uh, a miracle. Yeah? Anyway, so what I'm trying to say is that uh, services are, I mean, yeah, there are some segments of services where, you know, productivity growth are without you know, the, the, the debasing the quality of the product is possible, yeah? but uh, in many areas, it is difficult or impossible. No? So because of, the, and on the other hand, in manufacturing, you can use mechanization, chemical processes, it's very easy to uh, raise productivity. So this is why there's a uh, differential productivity growth rates and therefore different uh, the, uh, sorry, falling relative prices for manufactured products, which is creating this illusion that manufacturing is not important anymore. Yeah? Now, if uh, the industrial legend is due to the very dynamism of a country's manufacturing sector, why are we worried about it? Isn't it a good thing, actually, that you are deindustrializing? Well, not necessarily, because uh, deindustrialization. Oh, sorry. Happens because of the comparative dynamism of the manufacturing sector. That doesn't mean that your manufacturing sector is internationally competitive. Yeah? All you need to have the industrialization is that your own manufacturing <coughs> sector grows faster than your service sector. Yeah? So actually, in the case. Cases uh, like the UK, you can have a yeah, uh, declining manufacturing sector exactly because of uh, the, this uh, the lack of uh, international competitiveness. And this will naturally create. Uh, sorry, oh, what's wrong with this uh, PowerPoint? This will create. Uh, in the short term, balance of payment problems and eventually falling standards of living in the long run. Yeah? Because if you're not competitive internationally, it means that, 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 that eventually your living standard will fall. Yeah? Okay. Whether or not a country's manufacturing sector is dynamic by international standard, the shrinkage of the relative weight of manufacturing sector also has a negative impact on productivity growth. Yeah? So as I have explained, you know, the manufacturing sector inherently has much faster productivity growth rate. So if the relative size of services become bigger and bigger, The sector that generates uh, the productive growth mainly, namely the manufacturing sector, is uh, going to become smaller and smaller in the relative terms. And this will the, the make the economy grow more slowly. Now, for rich countries, actually, this may not be a disaster. You know, a lot of people think that rich countries uh, shouldn't grow or even de-grow. I mean, if you have that view, and actually there is no big deal that, that, that uh, the rich countries do not grow very fast. Yeah? And of course, uh, there will be you know, a lot of uh, 
consequences for distribution struggle, but apart from that, but that the uh, other countries, because uh, the, this uh, deindustrialization hasn't been just about the rich countries. Yeah? A lot of developing countries since the 1980s experienced that, that uh, huge uh, deindustrialization. I mean, Brazil is uh, the best example. In late 1980s, uh, the manufacturing sector used to account for something like 35 percent of Brazilian GDP. Today it's uh, barely 12. You know, I mean they lost a huge amount of uh, manufacturing, and yeah, those countries that uh, re really have to be worried because uh, the, the shrinking manufacturing sector means uh, that uh, slow growth. Yeah? And I'll get back to this point uh, in a few minutes. Moreover, the, the deindustrialization de has a negative effect on a country's balance of payments because services are inherently more difficult to export than manufacture goods. Well, inherently is uh, the, the used advisedly because that, uh, this is uh, mainly because of uh, immigration control. I mean, the point is that, that uh, most services require that their providers and consumers are in the same location. Yeah? I mean, as far as I know, uh, no one has invented a way to uh, do a haircut uh, remotely. Yeah? I mean, if you want someone to come and clean your the, the, the house, uh, the person has to be in the same place. Yeah? I mean, uh, if you want to be served uh, nicely that, uh, by a waiter in a restaurant, the person has to be there. Yeah? Uh, the waiter cannot uh, sit in, you know, the, the Mumbai and you know, do this uh, wait, uh, waiting uh, the, the remotely. Yeah, yeah so the, the easy solution would be to import these people, but then all countries have the, 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 the very strict uh, immigration control, so the, it becomes impossible to export these services. Now, some services uh, have become exportable, yeah? with the help of the internet and cheaper telephone services and you know, stuff like that. So now you have, I don't know, I mean, the American hospitals that, that, that are sending files of uh, MRI scans uh, to Bangalore and some guy in Bangalore reading the scans and sending the results uh, back. And, you know, and uh, you have uh, the, the call centers for you know, UK companies in wherever, I mean, the Philippines or, you know, uh, Bangladesh or so you know the, some services have become exportable but actually when you look at these uh, figures you realize how difficult it is actually to export services eh? services trade as a share of world trade went up a bit uh, in the 80s from about 17% to 20% but then since then, this uh, the ratio has been basically fluctuating around 20%. Yeah? There has uh, not been a market increase in, yeah, in relative terms of uh, service export. Yeah? This shows that however fascinating the story of sending MRI scans to Bangalore might sound, actually these are very small part of yeah, international trade. So, I'm really sorry about this uh, the PowerPoint. I mean, it doesn't behave. There are lots of spelling mistakes. Given all of this, a rising share of services in its economy means that the country will have lower export earnings, and unless uh, the exports of manufactured goods rise pro dis proportionately, the country won't be able to pay for the same amount of import as before, especially if the deindustrialization of a negative kind accompanied by weakening international competitiveness uh, like the UK case, the balance of payment problem could be even more serious. Eh? Now, when I say these things, you know, the, some people still come back saying, yeah, but, you know, now knowledge is more important, you know. We, we now live in a knowledge economy. Eh? 
you know, gone are the days when services were characterized by low productivity growth and low tradability because it was basically servants and yeah, stuff like that. Now, knowledge intensive services such as finance, engineering, design, accounting, consultancy are the engines of growth. And in that kind of world, you know, we need uh, service based growth yeah, because that's where knowledge is, that's where productivity growth is. Some developing countries, at least some, can skip industrialization altogether and achieve economic developments through service-based growth. Well, against this, uh, the, I first want to point out that we have always lived in a knowledge economy. I mean, it was never the act of making things that determined who is rich and who is not. Yeah? I mean, the reason why China was the most developed economy until the 17th century was because it uh, the, had a lot of uh, knowledge that other countries didn't have. Eh? And it's actually quite uh, amazing. I mean, uh, when you go back in history, they invented just about everything. Eh? Actually, the, the <laughs> I the remember the back in 99 that I was the, the attending a conference in the San Francisco and the, one of the local newspapers had this article titled even life was invented in China. So I started reading it and realized that they found, uh, well, what then was uh, the oldest known uh, fossil record of an organism. And the San Francisco, the, the, the people, you know, the, they have a very long standing big Chinese community, obviously was sick of the their Chinese friends that are uh, telling them that oh, we invented uh, paper, we invented uh, this, we invented that. You know? So that uh, these guys are uh, poking fun at that. You know, even life was invented in China, but actually these are quite amazing. I mean, a lot of things were invented in China. And then, why did uh, Britain uh, become the leader? Because uh, the uh, they found uh, new technologies uh, to manufacture the, the, the textiles with uh, machines. Yeah. And then why was that uh, Britain beat by the Germans and the Americans? Because uh, they found that uh, superiority in their knowledge about the chemical and mechanical industries and so on. Yeah? So it's uh, uh, not as if uh, knowledge wasn't there and it was all like, yeah? I mean, unadulterated, unskilled workers and unadulterated yeah? capital, whatever that means. Yeah? And then suddenly we now have knowledge. Yeah? I mean, this is uh, completely false. Yeah? Also, more importantly, the manufacturing sector has always been the main source of new productive knowledge in the form of new technologies and new organization techniques. So, uh, yeah, that's not in the PowerPoint. So first of all, that is where actually a lot of knowledge creation is. Yeah? In the UK, in the US, I have told you that only about 10%, maybe 12% of uh, the GDP is produced by the manufacturing industry. Eh? In both countries, the manufacturing sector does between 60 and 75% of, uh, depending on the year, total R&D. Eh? So you think it's uh, unimportant, but in terms of knowledge creation, this is the most important sector, eh? despite producing only 10% of output, it's uh, doing three quarters of uh, the, the R&D. Yeah? And the, the more important thing about that, the manufacturing sector is that when they invent the new knowledge, they can actually spread it very quickly by manufacturing things that embody those technologies. Yeah? Yeah, so some of the management consultants in McKinsey and uh, places like that uh, may be very competent and uh, very clever people, but, you know, at each point uh, they can talk to, well, at most one room full of people. Yeah? But if you invent a machine that allows people to, I don't know, mill flowers quickly, yeah, that, 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 uh, allow people that, that to manufacture the phones are more quickly and so on, then yeah, potentially everyone can use it. 
it's not just the machines, but uh, also organizational techniques uh, that the manufacturing sector uh, has been spreading. Modern uh, retail uh, industry would not be organized in the way uh, it is uh, without modern inventory management techniques uh, developed in the manufacturing sector. You know, these days uh, we even kind of uh, the, the see restaurants that are using organizational techniques are from the manufacturing industry. Yeah? McDonald's. In McDonald's, they don't cook. Yeah? They assemble food. Yeah? Some of you must have uh, been to your sushi. Yeah? I mean, the, the food comes to you on a conveyor belt. Yeah? These are all ideas uh, from the manufacturing sector. Yeah? Secondly, many knowledge-intensive services that are supposed to be new have always been there, as I, that I have already told you. Yeah. Thirdly, all these supposedly knowledge-intensive services sell mostly to manufacturing firms, so their success depends on manufacturing success. Of course, uh, you can specialize in exporting some of these services, and the UK has been actually very good at it. Yeah? So that, that, that uh, it, I mean, has such huge uh, deficit in manufacturing uh, trade. So, and so that it's not quite able to pluck that gap with uh, surplus from service trade, but uh, this country has been able to generate something like a uh, service trade surplus equivalent to 4% of GDP. This is very large. Yeah? In the US, uh, it's uh, only about 1%. Yeah? And a lot of this is uh, that, uh, like uh, you know, sort of high productivity services, like finance, management, consulting, engineering, and so on. But you know, many of these uh, basically sell to manufacturing firms. Yeah? And over time, if you specialize in these services without having the necessary manufacturing base, your competitiveness uh, could be eroded. Yeah? So for example, the, I have a friend who used to work for this uh, famous uh, uh, semiconductor company called the, the ARM, ARM, based in Cambridge. And he told me that, yeah, you know, the, we, we manufacture nothing in Britain. Now we manufacture everything in East Asia, in Korea, Malaysia, China. <coughs> and then, yeah, this means that we have to travel there all the time, have to live there, that, that you know. He's, uh, I mean, it's an anecdotal evidence, but uh, he's uh, telling me, well, I wouldn't be surprised if the company relocates to East Asia in uh, 10, 15 years' time, yeah? because it's uh, becoming increasingly difficult. Yeah? Increasingly difficult uh, to recruit people uh, for one thing, you know, because that, uh, if you have to spend four months uh, in you know, East Asia while your home is in England, uh, it's not easy. Yeah? Well, so far I have shown how you cannot have a prosperous economy without a strong manufacturing sector. But then people keep coming back uh, that with uh, examples uh, like yeah, Switzerland, Singapore, India. I have already yeah, dispelled uh, the, the myth about the Switzerland. But you know, the Singapore is uh, considered to be a service-based uh, success story. You know, the former Prime Minister of India, Manmohan Singh, got, uh, once uh, said that if uh, China is a uh, workshop of the world, India will be the office of the world. Yeah? So we will develop by specializing in business services. Yeah? But, uh, I mean, you've already seen Switzerland, but uh, the, these two other countries are not, once again, what you think. I mean, uh, first of all, you may or may not have noticed in when I showed you this table earlier, but Singapore is actually the second most industrialized country in the world. Actually, the Singapore government has an explicit policy to maintain the share of manufacturing in the economy to around 20%. Yeah? And they are actually doing a lot of uh, the industrial policy to make that happen. Yeah? 
Well, interestingly, Singapore is another country that is uh, as misunderstood as uh, Switzerland. Uh, so I even uh, invented this idea of uh, the Singapore problem, or life is uh, stranger than fiction. You know, when you read about Singapore in the financial press, in standard books on economics, we'll only hear about is free trade policy and its uh, welcoming attitude towards uh, foreign investors, which it has. Yeah? But you will never be told that 90% of land in Singapore is owned by the government, 85% of housing is that, uh, supplied by a government-owned uh, housing corporation, and a staggering 22% of GDP is uh, produced by state-owned enterprises, including the famous Singapore Airlines. Huh? <coughs> yes, I often uh, uh, challenge my graduate students, you know, give me one economic theory, it doesn't matter what it is, neoclassical, Marxist, Keynesian, Austrian, give me one economic theory that can single-handedly explain Singapore, I dare say there is no such theory. This is a beautiful example to illustrate how you need to know different economic theories. But you know, the point is that, uh, that, that in this talk that it is also a very highly you know, industrialized country which has an explicit policy to maintain you know, uh, the, the manufacturing sector. As for India, India's service trade has not been actually much of a success. Yeah? Between 2008 and 16, India recorded service trade surplus equivalent to only 1.1% of GDP. Yeah? Actually, that, uh, it depends on the, exactly which uh, the data set and time series you look at, but until 2004, you know, a decade after the, the, the kind of uh, stories that, uh, about Indian service-based uh, success uh, came out. Until 2004, uh, India didn't even make any trade surplus in services. Yeah? It's only after 2004, and uh, uh, according to some data, even 2007 or eight, that uh, it started making uh, surplus in the trade, uh, the service trade. But I mean, the level is very low, 1.1% yeah? uh, of GDP. Yeah? which covered only 14% of its uh, merchandise trade deficit. Yeah? This is uh, manufacturing and, say, food, fuel, and so on. Yeah? So it's not just manufacturing. Yeah? So this means that unless it increases its uh, service trade surplus by seven times, India cannot maintain its uh, current pace of economic development without a serious balance of payment problem. And also, there's uh, worrying news for India because uh, the, the development of artificial intelligence is going to hit India first. Yeah? Because it will be exactly those uh, low-level service uh, activity that AI will be applied first. Yeah? yeah, eventually it might hit you know, university lecturers and uh, medical doctors and God knows what, but uh, it's uh, first going to hit call centers and the, the basic software engineers and you know, uh, basic accountants and MRI reading and stuff like that. You know? So India has that, that, that it's a work cut out for itself. You know? Okay, so I should conclude. To sum up, uh, uh, because people have mistakenly bought into this uh, myth of uh, post-industrial knowledge economy, a lot of poor decisions have been made. Uh, many rich countries, not all of them, you know, Singapore, Germany, Switzerland, you know, th they are perfectly aware of uh, the holes in this argument, but many countries, especially the UK and the US, uh, have you know, just sat and watched uh, the, the, their manufacturing industry the, the going into decline, believing that uh, this is a natural thing or even a good thing. Yeah? More worryingly, many developing countries have, you know, just accepted this uh, the, the phenomenon that, uh, which is uh, uh, sometimes called premature deindustrialization. I mean, experiencing deindustrialization even before you reach uh, the, the high level of income, and in some cases, uh, before even you even finish your industrialization. Yeah? Because uh, the, they were told that 
you know, this is another big deal in this uh, the post-industrial knowledge economy because uh, they can now skip industrialization. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, that this uh, myth, uh, that although not totally false, uh, that uh, has uh, misled a lot of people and has uh, resul resulted in uh, a lot of uh, unfortunate uh, the circumstances. You know, I think uh, the famous uh, Brexit vote is uh, not unrelated uh, to this uh, the myth, yeah? because a lot of people just thought well, I mean, if you know, Huddersfield and uh, Liverpool and all the um, go down the sinkhole, that's fine because it's a natural order of things, you know. It's actually a good thing. You know? And then, you know? anyway, let me stop there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hajun Chang, for that insightful and stimulating talk. Uh, we'll go to some questions now, so please raise your hand. And we would have a microphone up there, so please speak really loudly if you've got a question. Yep, do you want to? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I've got the first question. I'm going to ask something very general. In your, in your, in your book on uh, Kicking Away the Ladder, you seem to be saying that, uh, yes, there is this issue, but to a certain extent that can be dealt with the mechanism of kind of an unfair trade, trade system. Mm -hmm. uh, you obviously don't, don't think that's something possible in the long term. So what do you think we should do? Do you think, you know, the triple's right, we should have more manufacturing jobs? Do you think we, we should go out of this room and pick a shovel and <laughs> some manufacturing? So, and how do you think that's also possible to kind of reverse the dynamics we have now? Uh, with, you know, manufacturing stuff. Yeah. No, no, the, you know, the, first of all, the, you know, the, you know, where do I begin? I mean, it's a long story. Okay, the, let's uh, begin at this uh, point. I mean, the Donald Trump, yeah? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, that, you know, I am a well-known advocate of uh, what is known as uh, infant industry protection. Mm -hmm. So when Donald Trump uh, decided that, that uh, he wants to raise tariff against you know, Chinese steel imports and so on, a lot of people are asking, so are you supporting Donald Trump? But obviously I'm not because you know, my view is that, that uh, yes, I mean, the, the developing countries need protection, the developed countries don't. Mm -hmm. No, even in developed countries, you can have some temporary protection to make adjustment, yeah? but that, that, that as a rule, I mean, that they shouldn't have uh, long-term protection. Yeah? So that's uh, the, the first point. But uh, secondly, you know, especially in the rich countries where manufacturing industries are very complicated, you cannot rebuild it by simply raising <laughs> prices and you know uh, giving people incentives. Yeah? No, I mean this country is a beautiful example. Yeah? After the financial crisis, sterling has devalued about 35, 40 yeah? percent. The manufacturing trade deficit has not budged. Well, except in the last year, which had a slight you know, uptick, manufacturing trade uh, deficit has uh, not uh, budged, despite this uh, huge uh, the price incentive. Yeah? No, in other countries, for example, when the South Korea had the financial crisis in 1998, yeah? the currency was uh, the, the, the devalued by <coughs> something like 30 percent. And there's a huge uh, the manufacturing export boom. Yeah? Manufacturing export uh, increased by like uh, the 18 percent in one year. Yeah? Why? Because uh, now that uh, your currency is uh, 30 percent cheaper, if you can uh, earn the same dollar, it means that uh, you're earning 30 percent more in the uh, local uh, currency. Yeah? But in this country, the manufacturing sector has not been able to respond to this uh, the huge price incentive lasting for like 10 years because uh, the surrounding conditions and the kind of uh, the 
manufacturing system has been so weakened that it doesn't have the supply capacity anymore. Eh? So in a country like the US or the UK, which has uh, seen this uh, the, the huge uh, deindustrialization, erosion of skills, yeah, kind of dismemberment of uh, the, the linkages between you know university, business, uh, local communities, and so on, you need a huge program to rebuild them. So yes, I mean even if you want uh, more manufacturing jobs, yeah, in the United States uh, or in the UK. Is not going to be done by raising tariffs or the devaluing the currency. Eh? You need a proper reindustrialization program. So let's leave it there. Yes? Yeah, you talked briefly about the role that automation is going to play in services mm -hmm. and how we might see a similar trend in reducing the number of jobs uh, in services as we have in manufacturing. And I was wondering what you thought about the sort of as the Paul Mason post-capitalism, if we go down a certain political route, or if we go down another political route, we might slide into some sort of neo feudal dystopia <laughs> where they give us UBI to buy Netflix all day. Yeah. <laughs> and what, what did you think about that sort of dichotomy? <laughs> and yeah. No, I mean, uh, what uh, you have to realize is that, uh, you know, technologies are not destiny. Eh? I mean, we can control technologies. Eh? No, of course, uh, people want to give you the impression that this uh, cannot be controlled. Yeah? And therefore, whatever happens uh, has to happen. And you know, when you look more closely, those people who say those things are people who are benefiting from these changes. Yeah, yeah so when the, the, there was a huge uh, debate on globalization you know, in the late 90s, early 2000s, you know, the, 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 in one of the Davos at the World Economic Forum meetings, uh, the, the chairman of the International Congress of uh, Chambers of Commerce famously said that these people protesting against uh, free trade and so on outside uh, the venues uh, were the modern Luddites. Yeah? Luddites are these uh, the 19th century textile artisans uh, in northern England who thought they could uh, bring their jobs back uh, by destroying the machines. Yeah? Yeah, so when you uh, put it like that, then uh, it becomes, uh, uh, sorry, sounds inevitable, and therefore whoever is against uh, the new changes is uh, the backward looking. No, it's not like that. Yeah? Because, uh, the, you know, if you look at objective indicators of uh, globalization, you will find that the world was actually far more globalized in the, say, late 19th, early 20th century than in the, say, 19th. 50s, 60s, or 70s, yeah? despite the fact that the earlier period was run on very primitive technologies, yeah? steamships and wired, not even wireless, telegraphy. Whereas by the 60s, we had all the technologies that we have today except for the internet. Yeah? There were even the primitive forms of fax machines. Yeah? There were teletext and uh, you know, planes are a bit slower, but uh, yeah, you could uh, fly e anywhere. Huh? Despite that, we had much lower degree of uh, globalization in that period, which suggests that actually it was mainly because of uh, the, the regulations that uh, the world wasn't that <coughs> much globalized. It wasn't because of lack of technology. Huh? So that's uh, one uh, great example showing how technologies only set the outer boundaries and exactly what happens depends on your policy and politics. Eh? So jobs, you know, I mean, that, you, yeah, I mean, that if you think uh, that some technologies are going to destroy too many jobs uh, too quickly, you, you can ban it. Yeah? Why not? You, know, you don't have to ban it forever. You could say, well, the, for the next 20 years, we do not allow research in this area. Eh? <coughs> The society can the, the channel all this uh, the money and you know, energy spent in the, the developing robots and AIs into developing robots and AIs uh, for things that we need, yeah? like uh, the, the robots uh, that can help uh, the, the old people at home, or yeah? I mean, the AI programs that can help teaching and so on, yeah? instead of, you know, Apparently, the, 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 one of the top scientific institutions in my home country, South Korea, is uh, developing killer robots. Yeah? 
No, uh, you should ban it. Yeah. And that, that force them to do socially more useful things. Yeah. Yeah. So I, the first point is I don't think uh, these uh, the technologies have any inevitable outcomes. Yeah. It's uh, for us uh, to control. Yeah. But insofar as that uh, you know, uh, you put it beautifully that that uh, maybe I uh, will coach you that if, if you give me a uh, give me your name. I mean, uh, you know, sorry. Corner, yeah. So I'll, that, uh, no, because that, that uh, paying uh, people <laughs> universal basic income to buy Netflix, yeah. That's I mean, uh, put very well. Yeah? So you know that uh, in many circles, I mean, the progressive, conservative, yeah, kind of uh, tech-oriented, whatever. I mean, people believe that you know whatever happens in the sphere of technology should be allowed to happen and if the result is high unemployment then we will have to just uh, that, uh, keep these people alive you know, with you know, some kind of basic income. Yeah? Now I think uh, that, that the idea is uh, very, very wrong. Yeah? Because work, I mean of course uh, there are a lot of work uh, that uh, jobs uh, that are painful that should not exist uh, if we can't uh, that, that, that afford them. You know that uh, that that uh, should uh, be regulated and so on, but uh, there are also a lot of jobs uh, that give uh, people meaning of life. Yeah, people uh, make make people feel useful about you know, um, themselves. Uh, that you know that there's this uh, that actually very prescient uh, science fiction written in 1951 by the American science fiction writer called Kurt Vonnegut. It's called Play a Piano. And uh, it's a great book that uh, I highly recommend it. It uh, uh, imagines a world where everything has been automated. Yeah? And they have very high productivity. And no one has to work, yeah? except for a few managers and engineers in the corporation that manufactures these machines. Yeah? But everyone is miserable. Yeah? They have nothing to do. Yeah? I mean, they, they don't lack in material comfort. Yeah? But they have no meaning in life. Yeah? So the story begins like that. And yeah, so the, we really need to think uh, the, uh, what is the role of work uh, in our life. Yeah? Now, I'm not saying that we should uh, maintain the current regime, but you know, we, we cannot just that, that, uh, kind of so casually say, well, if there's no work, people have to eat, give them money. Yeah? They have to watch Netflix, give them money. Yeah? No, I'm not saying that all advocates of uh, universal basic income have this view, but uh, the, there's a lot of people who think like that. And I think you know, whatever your conclusion is, before saying that, think about meaning of work in our individual lives and also in society. Yeah? Yes? Um, you, you talked about restrictions on immigration and mm -hmm. how that's leading to basically making it very difficult to uh, yeah. Surely the solution to that should, isn't, is just uh, to, to lower restriction on immigration and uh, help to, you know, uh, promote immigration, because then that'll make services a lot easier mm -hmm. across borders, and um, once we have more international cooperation like that, then that problem should, should it becomes less of a problem, no? Yeah, sure. No, I, I, you know, I'm an immigrant, yeah? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm in favor of uh, the, the making immigration easier, yeah? But the problem is that, that, that with immigration, you know, people are not like uh, iPads. Yeah, they come with rights. Yeah, yep. yeah, they come with that, 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 that human rights. They come with political rights. They come with economic rights. Yes, uh, you can, and almost all countries uh, that, 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 that restrict uh, their rights uh, sometimes very severely, but you cannot give them no rights. Yeah. So once uh, that, uh, you accept immigration, the consequences are far more, far bigger and far more complicated than importing another iPad. Yeah? So you need to have that uh, political debate. Yeah? So even if it's uh, e it, uh, going to make uh, the services cheaper, as it has uh, done uh, in this country, you know, the, the number of uh, Polish and Hungarian workers that are working in the you know, food and the, the other hospitality sectors is huge and uh, without uh, those uh, immigrants that uh, uh, your cost of living would have uh, risen a lot 
more. Yeah? And actually, for someone like me, I mean, it actually it, uh, made my life uh, a lot easier when I visited uh, Scotland because I still find the uh, Scottish accent very difficult to, to understand. And Polish accents are uh, a lot easier for me. So, I mean, when I uh, went uh, for a holiday in Scotland uh, last year after uh, like 12 year gap, I found it uh, much easier to get by, you know, because that, uh, now I, I could un understand almost everyone, yeah? Whereas that, uh, before it was you know, uh, not easy. Yeah? Anyway, so yes, I mean, that, that it has happened, but, you know, each uh, society that, that, that has uh, a certain limit to carrying capacity yeah? in terms of uh, immigration, because, you know, you cannot say that, yeah, we will totally, you know, liberalize immigration. You know? uh, unfortunately, you know, in a world where the gap between the richest and the poorest countries is like 500 times, you, know, you will have huge number of immigration. Yeah? yeah, so within European Union, you know, most people want to live by where they are born, you know, I mean, they don't particularly want to move, yeah? But, you know, <laughs> When the gap is uh, so large, I mean, there's a huge incentive uh, to move, and uh, how are we going to the, the digest this? So the, this is what makes uh, the, the immigration policy very different from uh, other trade policies because people come with rights. Yeah. yeah. There's also when you mm -hmm. were talking about earlier, and you said uh, you, you you sort of mentioned like industry uh, in a very sort of overall sense, but obviously there's a lot of difference to a, a low-skilled worker working in a coal mine. In the UK, mm -hmm. than someone on an assembly line producing a jet engine, which requires very, uh, you know, it's incredible. Of course, yeah, yeah, job, yeah. Right? And of course, I, I do understand what mm -hmm. you mean, where the, the UK seems to be policy wise less focused on uh, the, I, I goods production, mm -hmm. manufacturing, rather unlike compared, unlike, uh, compared to Germany, mm -hmm. for instance. But surely the sort of protection of industry, um, you know, sort of no matter what it is, is. Because we have seen a decline in things like oh no no yeah but uh, like no but of course yeah. is that really a problem when what we should be focusing on because what we're competitive about because we're never going to be competitive in producing steel against a lot of the other countries like China um, well, yeah so now yeah yeah no no I mean it's a historically like jet engines, for instance. yeah no it's a historically contingent uh, process so you know today yes I mean that the steel in this country you know. Yeah, except in some very specialist steels that uh, you have no hope, yeah? But, no, no, but uh, that state of the world is a consequence of the past policy decisions, yeah? You know, Germany still has that uh, competitive uh, steel industry, yeah? You know, that uh, British uh, ministers uh, love to boast that uh, we are producing huge number of cars today, yeah? But these are all kind of... Uh, the lower level the assembly jobs. I mean, the, the cars are designed and the, the, you know, the engineered all in other countries. Yeah? So the, could you have not saved the car industry? I mean, today, you know, you cannot change this. Yeah? But I mean, it's a the, the consequence of a series of uh, decisions which uh, the, the were made in a certain way because of this belief that it's OK to lose uh, the manufacturing. Yeah? No, but uh, why do we say that a uh, better standard of living? I mean, it could have been even better, you know, that's the point. Yeah? Uh, no, you are that, that, that being like uh, some people who say, oh, that, that, that the world is uh, great because we are richer than ever. Yeah? But the question you have to ask is, could we have been even richer or more evenly richer? You know? No, because uh, unless uh, you are shrinking, you will be always better than ever. Yeah? So this is a trick that uh, politicians uh, use that, uh, for you. Yeah? No, that is, oh, our income is higher than ever, yeah? Okay, <laughs> higher than ever, but uh, could have been even higher if you used a better policy? Hmm? Uh, we've got and time for two yeah. more. Could you... Uh, no, sure. Yeah. Okay, maybe okay yeah. the last one, yeah. yeah. I, uh, sorry, my question is about education. Mm -hmm. in this country, the policy of government for the past couple of decades has been to encourage more young people to go to university uh, rather than um, doing the traditional career paths to manufacturing. And those degrees are designed to set you up for a career in services. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, do you think that's been a bad policy for the overall economic health of the country? And secondly, how can governments encourage more youngsters to go to manufacturing jobs early in their careers rather than encouraging them to go in a 
Right. Yeah, first of all, you know, a lot of, I mean, put it this way, I'm in favor of more education for making people <coughs> better, yeah? making, uh, sorry, helping people realize themselves. Yeah? But if you believe that uh, more education is going to uh, produce a uh, higher growth, you are mistaken. Yeah? There is no evidence. Yeah? And especially at the university level, you know, a lot of uh, the, the university qualification is about sorting. Yeah? It's got nothing to do with that, that, uh, imparting skills. Yeah? Well, not nothing, but uh, the relatively little to do with yeah? imparting <laughs> skills. Yeah? No, because, that, uh, for example, this country, when I first came, you know, that uh, was uh, perfectly uh, capable of managing itself uh, with uh, only 16% of people going to university. Yeah? In Switzerland, it was uh, 11%. Yeah? And it has uh, one of the highest uh, standards of living. Yeah? So, I mean, I mean, all in favor of yeah, that uh, education for its sake, but uh, if you believe that this is somehow going to raise your productivity, you are uh, seriously mistaken. Yeah? The second point is, uh, you know, having said that, yes, I mean, that, that, I'm not saying that uh, education is that, uh, useless for the real world completely. Yeah? But uh, you could design it uh, that, uh, better, kind of uh, suited for the real world than uh, you know, otherwise. Yeah? No, because uh, the, in Switzerland, in Germany, a lot of uh, the kids uh, go through this uh, that, uh, kind of career tracks uh, that will yeah, make them skilled workers uh, who earn uh, 100,000 euros per year. You know? I mean, they don't have university qualification, but uh, they went to these uh, the, the technical schools, did apprenticeship. Yeah, so when there are lots of those kind of jobs, then yeah, a lot of people will not want to go to university. But uh, today in this country, especially in my own country, you know, you 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 need a university degree even to stack uh, the, the boxes in the supermarkets. Yeah? <laughs> then everyone has to go. Yeah? No, this is uh, like a theater where some people started to standing up, yeah? and everyone has to stand. Yeah? You have the same view you feel more uncomfortable. Hmm? No, this is uh, that, 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 uh, basically that, that known as a problem of uh, positional goods. Yeah? Because uh, if everyone has a uh, university degree, in order to distinguish yourself, you will have to have a master's degree. Hmm? And if uh, everyone has a master's degree, you will have to have a PhD. Hmm? No, your grandchildren will have to have a PhD to work in the Sainsbury's. Yeah? <laughs> If we keep at uh, this track, so we need to radically rethink uh, the, what role education has to play in the society. You know? we'll get time for one more. Yeah, one more. Yeah. Yes, well, thank you, uh, thank you very much for this very uh, insightful and uh, uh, very uh, entertaining uh, uh, presentation and analysis. So I think I agree with your analysis of the industrialization, mm -hmm. and I also think I, I, I agree with what you say that um, the, the the UK and the US. Uh, too quickly let a lot of public infrastructure go. Public infrastructure, which countries like Germany very clearly That's need right, yeah. to actually support the industrial sector. So these, <coughs> these, these flagship German companies, they don't operate on their own, but they're heavily Absolutely, supported yeah. uh, by, by public infrastructure yeah. like the Fraunhofer Society Fraunhofer, and, yeah. and, and very many other, mm -hmm. very many other areas. Um, but I would have a question on what to do now. Mm -hmm. and that's the question of industrial policy. And uh, now you, you, you happen to come from the country that perhaps has pursued the most successful industrial policy of all countries mm -hmm. over Arguably, the past yeah. three or four mm. decades. You certainly come from the region of the world that has a good track record in pursuing industrial policy. Now, but if we look globally, then we need to see that East Asia happens to be about the only part of the world with actually successful industrial policies. Mm -hmm. Whereas in very large, in very many other parts of the world, especially when we look at the import substitution industrialization strategies pursued for many decades, industrial policies on balance have failed. So for each East Asian industrial policy which has worked, we can probably show you three which haven't worked. Mm -hmm. And how can we help distinguish the good ones from the bad ones when it comes to industrial policy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
a number of points. Uh, first of all, yes, I mean, uh, whatever you are recommending, I mean, some people will do it better than others. So, uh, you know, whatever policy you recommend, I mean, some will be more successful than others. Uh, so, I think uh, the fact that uh, some are more successful than others uh, is uh, not, uh, sorry, only some of them are successful is uh, not a recommendation for not doing it. Yeah? So, I don't know, I mean, uh, when we are reading the biography of, uh, I don't know, Steve Jobs or Winston Churchill, you know, we are not thinking, okay, I'm going to be another Churchill, you know, you learn lessons. So I think uh, there's still the point in kind of uh, recommending these things. But uh, more importantly, you know, the, the, when you do careful comparison of uh, policies used in East Asia and Latin America, there were actually quite significant differences, you know, because that, 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 that focus of East Asian industrial policy was protection so that you can join the you know, world market and uh, fight it out with the big boys. You know? No, seriously, I mean, uh, when the, 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 back in 1965, South Korea produced 100 cars. You know? and at the time, but, uh, General Motors alone was uh, producing like 5 million cars. You know? So if you just start that, 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 you know, think about the scale of achievement that was uh, done by this, that uh, you have to pay attention to what they are doing, uh, they did. And when you compare them with uh, Latin American policies, uh, you know, Latin American companies uh, didn't have any ambition to become intentionally competitive. You know? They just wanted, you know, uh, let me put it uh, even more provocatively. You know? In the 1950s, neither South Korea, nor India, nor Brazil could make nice cars. Huh? The Indian approach was, well, nice cars are actually imperialist uh, conspiracy. Yeah? We don't want nice cars. Yeah? <laughs> we are going to reproduce 1950s at, at, uh, ambassador forever. Yeah? By the 1980s, Indian car industry became a joke. Yeah? The Brazilian attitude was, we cannot make nice cars, but we want nice cars. Yeah? So let's ask uh, Runo, Ford, uh, Fiat to come and make nice cars for us. Yeah? But there was no ambition that this was uh, going to be an export industry. Hmm? The Korean approach was, we cannot make nice cars, so we are going to drive around in shit cars, yeah? <laughs> until we can make nice ones. And they've done that. Yeah? So there was a whole different approach to these things. Yeah? The fact that they used uh, protectionism, they that, uh, used uh, state regulation, they used uh, the subsidies, those are tools. Yeah? What matters is why are you using, uh, sorry, for what are you using these tools for? Yeah? So if your ambition is uh, to, yeah, I mean, uh, make nice European cars in Brazil yeah, and let people drive around it with no ambition that uh, you one day want to become an internationally competitive uh, the producer of uh, cars, then it's uh, natural that, 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 that you wouldn't uh, make it whatever you try. Yeah? The final point is, despite all this, you know, Latin American uh, import substitution was not a complete failure. You know, the, in the 60s and 70s, uh, per capita income in Latin America grew on average at 3.1% uh, per year. In the next uh, 40 years, uh, per capita income in the region grew at 0.8% uh, per year. You know? So it had problems. As I said, it was, I mean, not a strategy that would make those countries join the League of the World, uh, the, uh, sorry, rich countries, but it wasn't a complete waste time, waste of time. So let me leave it there. Yeah, that's all we have time for. So.